Welcome to episode three of A Brief History of Opera. My name is John Andrews. My lockdown beard is a little bit thicker, my broken fingers a little less painful, but the opening of the theatres remains as distant as ever. So instead, let me take you back 200 years to the generation following Gluck's reforms and opera's journey into the 19th century. <laughs> When most people think of opera, they tend to think of the great war horses of the later 19th century. But while the second half of the century was dominated by the works of Wagner and Verdi, Gounod and Bizet and the first of Puccini's mature masterpieces, all of which we'll discuss next time, the first half boasted a glorious flowering of creativity in the works of Rossini and Donizetti in Italy, Beethoven, Weber and Marschner in Germany, and Meyerbeer, Aubert and Adam in France. In a century dominated by immense political turmoil, 19th century opera was characterised by some seismic changes. Firstly, and most obviously, it was the splitting of operatic traditions along national, later nationalist lines. German, French and Italian approaches to opera evolve in very, very different directions in this period, and we lose that sense of a continent-wide lingua franca that had characterised the previous century. Secondly was the rise of Romanticism in literature and art, which spread into music, infusing plots with new levels of emotional turmoil, psychological darkness and an increasing bloodthirstiness. This is the era in which hardly any opera is without its storm, and on-stage death of sympathetic characters goes from being effectively a complete no-no to practically obligatory. Thirdly was the rise of Paris as the centre of operatic life and the consequent dominance of grand opera in the imagination of audiences. And finally, against all of these developments was the continuance of a highly conservative tradition in Italy, leading directly from Paisello and Cimarosa to Rossini, Donizetti and the young Verdi. And it was against the perceived dramatic inadequacies of this older, codified, tradition and approach that Wagner's radical challenge to opera's whole conception of itself as drama would come. But we're getting very much ahead of ourselves because just as all of these movements were beginning to develop in embryo, the artistic developments of the previous century were just coming together in a sublime synthesis in the person of a young composer in the service of the Archbishop of Salzburg. Johannes Chrysostomus Wolfgangus Theophilus Mozart grew up in Vienna, which had become the foremost musical centre in Europe, and more importantly a crossroads for all of these musical traditions. He grew to maturity surrounded by the heated reform debates centred around Gluck and Metastasio, which we discussed in the last episode. In the 1760s he also encountered the works of Giomelli in Stuttgart and Traetta in Parma, both of whom took their lead from Paris rather than Italy. They showed him the dramatic possibilities of fusing the French use of chorus, dance and accompanied recitative with the vibrant and dramatic arias of the Italian tradition. At the same time, the court orchestra at Mannheim was reaching hitherto unimagined levels of virtuosity, which made it possible for it to become a real actor in the musical drama in its own right. When the Mannheim court transferred to Munich, this great orchestra, arguably the greatest in Europe, was at Mozart's disposal for his first major operatic commission, Idomineo, in 1780. The libretto was old-fashioned, a shortened Italian version of a French original, but the musical leap forward is astonishing. <laughs> 
Rather than abandon keyboard accompanied recitative as Gluck had done, Mozart keeps it in his artistic armory, moving between dry recitative, orchestrally accompanied recitative, solo arias, duets, ensembles, choruses and dance as the story requires. It's this broadening of resources which really transforms opera from the solo aria dominated approach of the previous generation into something much more flexible and responsive. Of course, there were still plenty of solo arias and star singers to sing them, and the arias were still composed, as was traditional, in collaboration with the soloists themselves. And we can see Mozart tailoring his music to their strengths and weaknesses, just as Handel had done in the previous century, rewriting arias for the revivals of his operas with new casts. But as his letters to his father make crystal clear, the ensembles, choruses and instrumental sections were entirely under his control and what control. Mozart showed with flair and brilliance how large-scale musical structures could be built in opera. This was the age of the symphony, the concerto, the string quartet, and Mozart's ability to incorporate into his operas, especially in the finales, these complicated edifices of musical architecture, together with a free Italianate approach to melody and deep humanity in his characterization, is why his brief string of masterpieces remain at the heart of the repertoire today. But while The Marriage of Figaro, Don Giovanni and Così Fan Tutte are astonishing masterpieces, Mozart's immediate influence on his contemporaries was probably felt more through the two singspiels he wrote. The first, The Abduction from the Seraglio, was commissioned by Joseph II in 1782. The second, The Magic Flute, written for a suburban playhouse at the end of Mozart's short life in 1791. Singspiels were plays with songs. Funny, unpretentious, generally featuring low-born characters in humorous situations. 
In these, spoken dialogue alternated with fairly short, self-contained musical numbers in a self-consciously demotic style. Like their English cousins, the German middle classes were pretty suspicious of sung recitative, and indeed, when Mozart's Italian operas were translated into German, normally the recitative was scrapped and replaced with spoken dialogue. But in Seraglio, A Magic Flute, Mozart had attempted to fuse the high ideals of Enlightenment opera with these popular vernacular traditions, raising the quality of music to a sublime level while still appealing to genuinely popular tastes. And this potential to blend serious subject matter with a global musical appeal found a natural air in Ludwig van Beethoven's only attempt at opera. Fidelio was completed in 1814 amidst the turmoil of the Napoleonic Wars and can be seen of the, as the last great work of the classical era and perhaps the first of the Romantic. Based on a French revolutionary libretto, he fuses a highly political, gritty human drama with fairly traditional musical language in an opera which seems to turn almost into an oratorio at its climactic hymn to political freedom and the importance of of married love, about which Beethoven famously knew rather little. And as Beethoven was penning his political drama, the movement in literature known as Romanticism was getting into full swing. Emphasising the strong interaction between poetry, music and the visual arts, it flourished first in the works of Goethe, Schiller and E.T.A. Hoffmann. It was characterised by a rediscovery of medieval history and legend, an interest in supernatural powers, and the first dramatic exploitation of really extreme emotions, from sexual obsession to outright terror. With profound consequence for later generations, it also elevated the artist into an almost mythical figure whose authentic inner experiences elevated them above the mundane tastes and reactions of their audiences. In the opera house, the effect of this was that orchestras got bigger, harmonies more and more dissonant, and singing more declamatory and heroic. This finds operatic expression in Weber's Der Freischutz in 1821, a tale of curses and black magic in medieval Germany, quickly followed by Marschner's two Gothic horrors, Der Vampir and Hans Heiling. <laughs> dark gothic fictions used the singspiel tradition inherited from Mozart to take opera into dark, disturbing places. At the same time, a generation of comic composers also exploited it for the more light-hearted fun for which it had originally been intended. The German comic tradition flourished in a series of tuneful tales best remembered now through Lortzing's Tsar und Zimmermann, Flotto's Martha and Cornelius's Barber of Baghdad all of these laying the grounds for the growth and proliferation of what in the next generation will become operetta. But before passing on, one delicious dead end deserves mention because it illustrates so well what happened through the mirror of what might have been. The German composer and founder of the Vienna Philharmonic, Otto Nicolai, was a huge admirer of the Italian tradition and Donizetti in particular, and he felt that something really significant had been lost with the switch over to spoken dialogue at the beginning of the century, and he believed that Italianate vocal lyricism was completely compatible with the German language. 
He put his thoughts into practice with a delightful comic adaptation of Shakespeare's Merry Wives of Windsor in 1846, attempting to bring to the German vernacular the lyricism and unashamed tunefulness of the best of their Italian contemporaries. Unfortunately for us, he died only three years later at the young age of 39, and his experiment went no further. The German and the Italian traditions would remain destined to go in very different directions for the rest of the century. Meanwhile, in France, the combination of Lully's legacy, Gluck's reforms and the restoration of the monarchy in 1815 secured a luxurious level of spending that made Paris the opera capital of Europe. Dominated initially by Spontini, Cherubini and Mehul, then by a generation of towering figures writing in two separately identifiable forms, on the one hand grand opera and on the other opera comique. Rarely heard on the stage these days, French grand opera was dominated by the libretti of Eugène Scribe and by the irrepressible presence of Giacomo Meyerbeer in a series of sprawling, grandiose masterpieces including Robert le Diable and Les Huguenots. Combining his Parisian career with a court post in Prussia, Meyerbeer brought together the richer harmonic and dramatic musical palette of his native German Romanticism and the lyricism of Italian singing with the spectacle and grandeur of Lully's successors. These five-act beer moths were dominated by crowd scenes, elaborate ceremonials, dramatic and emotional confrontations and standalone ballets amid a sense of scale and magnificence. My beer was followed in Paris by Hubert and Alevi, but more importantly, the influence of grand opera was also diffused through Europe as composers from across the continent came to Paris to present their work. And so its aesthetic can be seen in Rossini's William Tell in 1829, Bellini's I Puritani in 1835, and as late as Verdi's Aida in 1871, not to mention the early works of Richard Wagner. Alongside this, opera comique developed from vernacular traditions and also from the Guerre des Buffons, the War of the Comedians that you'll remember from the previous century, when in 1752, Pergolesi's Serva Padrona had taken Paris by storm, outraging traditionalists. These operas generally use spoken dialogue, but unlike their German equivalents, were almost exclusively comic. Aubert and later Adolf Adam with Fra Diavolo were the first exponents of this form, but it would be taken up by another German immigrant, Jacques Offenbach, whose prolific career, more than any other, gave birth to this genre of light opera. But we've got ahead of ourselves again, because for the first half of the 19th century, Italian opera was so cemented in its own 18th century traditions that it remained to some extent isolated from the most extreme influences of Romanticism to the North. As the de facto national art form, it was inherently conservative, and although French ideas had arrived in the peninsula through composers such as Giomelli and Meyer, the new ideas coming from Germany found very little traction. Giacomo Rossini was a supreme melodist and dramatist. He inherited the traditions of both serious and comic opera from Paisello and Cimarosa, but Via Maya also had a huge admiration for Mozart's elegance and dramatic expression. Working with a highly restricted harmonic palette, he continued to work within the tradition of superstar singing inherited from the 18th century, and like Donizetti after him, he wrote his roles with individual singers in mind and tailored the arias carefully to show them off to their very, very best. In the early 19th century, the old da capo aria form evolved into something fairly similar. In the aria cabaletta, rather than ABA, you have an ABB structure where a character will sing the aria, the A section, in one emotional state. And then usually a character will arrive with a new piece of information that propels the plot and propels the character into a new emotional state. And then you have a usually faster cabaletta at the end and the cabaletta is sung twice with the second time the singer 
improvising their own vocal ornaments. This obviously provided the great divas and divos of the 19th century with an opportunity to display to full effect their technical, musical and dramatic brilliance. His operas demonstrate absolutely flawless structural control and pacing and a brilliant delineation of character. In a series of serious operas, including Armida, Hermione and La Donna del Lago, he won supremacy of the opera world with a magical combination of melodic invention, wit, pacing and crystalline orchestration. He readily embraced the emotional seriousness and psychological darkness of the Romantic authors, but through a musical style which remained emphatically rooted in classical harmonies of formal structures. He developed from Mozart and his native comic traditions the concerted finale and dramatic ensemble, and while he retained piano recitative in his comedies, he quickly moved into fully orchestral recitatives in his serious works, constantly undermining the distinction between aria and recitative. In 1824, he moved to the centre of the opera world in Paris, where William Tell was premiered, after which he retired aged only 37. Unfashionably for the time, he was happy for opera to be an entertainment for his public and artistically for it to be a negotiation with his singers who had substantial input into their roles, which remained some of the most technically difficult in all opera. The romantic idea of the composer as a tortured artist putting his life and soul into his work, heedless of an unappreciative public, was emphatically not for him. And he was content to spend the rest of his life in wealthy retirement as the grand man of Parisian musical life. His direct successor, Gaetano Donizetti, was a stupendously prolific force who once accepted a commission to write 12 operas in four years. Although he's best known for his comedies, The Elixir of Love and Don Pasquale, like Rossini, his reputation, fame and influence in his own time was based securely on his great tragedies, Anna Bolena, Maria Stuada and Lucia di Lammermoor. Donizetti absolutely embraced the Romantic era's love of extreme emotion and dark tragedy, but within a technically very conservative musical language. Indeed, Donizetti, better than many, illustrates the important lesson in the history of music, which is that progress is not always one of increasing complexity. Donizetti's formal structures, especially his very rigid adherence to the aria cabaletta form, are often simpler and more codified than Rossini's much more exploratory style a generation before. Extrovert and dramatic though, Donizetti is largely responsible for creating the classic sound of Italian romantic opera that we now know principally from his successor Verdi. And it is to the highly disparate worlds of Verdi, Wagner and Gounod, as well as Offenbach and Johann Strauss, that we'll journey next time.